All right, so I'm going to want to screen share the song. Fabulous, magic, technology rocks. All right, so as all of you may or may not have gathered, this is test number one. My name is Shane Gibson. I work for a company called RackN. RackN is a uh, infrastructure provisioning company. And how all of this ties in with bare metal and open source and digital rebar. Uh, digital rebar is our product, which is an open source platform. So there is 100% open source core to what we do. Like all of you, we have to make a living. So Rackin is that extension of digital rebar and is the services and professional uh, uh, engineering support, etc. We also have some advanced content and capabilities that we wrap around digital rebar, the open source core. So those of you looking for an open source provisioning platform, digital rebar provision is it. Forget about everything else out there. Those of you, how many of you heard of Cobbler? How about that? Okay, forget about Cobbler, it sucks. We destroy it, okay? Totally destroy it. And anything else that you use. So the open source digital rebar provision is aimed at essentially a cobbler replacement plus a bunch of other good stuff, plus it's not 20 years old in architecture. Um, there's the rack in for you. Uh, oh, we already introduced myself. Um, rack in as a company is relatively young. Um, I was the fourth employee in the company, um, but it's born from Dell's original hyperscale uh, production deployment um, program. So internally, Michael Dell came to a, a small team of people and said, we need to be able to go deploy repeatedly to tens of thousands of machines at once. Nobody can do this right. And so in that effort, our founders, Rob Hirschfeld, Greg, CTO, uh, Greg Althaus, our CTO, and uh, Victor Lowther, um, started developing what was then called Crowbar. Some of you may have heard of Crowbar, in the industry if you've been around bare metal provisioning. That was essentially the first generation of product. That was released by Dell as an open source solution as Open Crowbar was rewritten as Open Crowbar, went through two generations. And then they broke from that fold and started Rackin and started developing Digital Rebar, which is on its second rewrite. So it's essentially today a fourth generation of product that spans about eight years of experience uh, from starting from Dell with a target of being able to deploy repeatably and reliably to tens of thousands of systems. We don't care about 100, 200, 300. That's old hat, that's easy. We're a hyperscale company. And we'll talk about some of the differences that are necessary to get you to that level in a presentation today. But first, let's start with what is digital rebar? I mean, we talk about provisioning. Uh, it's fast, we like to say that. It's open source, a lot of people love that. Uh, it's simple, eh, not so much anymore. We've developed a lot of uh, capabilities to add on to it that allow it to get relatively complex. So it's as simple as you want to use it. It's 100% API driven. This is where we make one of our biggest differences, our biggest mark. Most all provisioning services today are designed around a fat binary that does something, a web app that does something, and then they stick a CLI on it. And then somebody says, oh goodness, we need an API. So they stick an API on it and they implement some API. Pretty soon you get this mess of what does and doesn't work in the API, the CLI, the UI, et cetera. Digital rebar is 100% API first. We implement everything as an API first, and then we dynamically generate the CLI from the API. Nobody sits down and tries to write the CLI and consume the API. It's generated from the API, it's modern in its design architecture from that perspective. We have a UI, or we call a UX. Some people call it SaaS, some people call it a portal, whatever you wanna call it, I don't care. The UX is a second class citizen. It consumes the API, so it's always falling behind. Interestingly, you can do some interesting things with the UX you can't as easily do with the CLI or the API. So pick your poison. But at the end of the day, we're a provisioning service underneath all of this. That means DHCP, Pixie Boot, 
is a general term, TFTP boot, an HTTP tree that sits over the top of your TFTP service. We've got this API which sits in front of everything. And then we've got this thing called BINL, but nobody cares about it because it's a Microsoft protocol, so we ignore it. We support it though. That's pretty much it. Questions? <laughs> Sorry, Bavesh, I was a little too fast on it. Not enough quite, oh, wait a minute. Okay, that's not the end. That's the basic beginning. Provisioning itself, just being able to provision a couple machines, it's freaking easy. I mean, you gotta know a little bit. You gotta know DHCP, you gotta know Pixie. You're gonna maybe need to have to figure out Kickstart and Precedes if you wanna do a little bit of automation. But there's a hundred tools out there that do that. Why do we think we're different? The reason we think that we're different is we think we found a huge gap. Everybody talks about today, what's one of the biggest rage <coughs> phrases out there? Serverless. God, don't talk to me about serverless. It makes my blood boil. You can call it function as a service and I won't choke you to death, but serverless is this huge rage, right? Why do they call it serverless? Because most developers don't care about hardware. They don't want to know what IP addresses are, subnets are. DHCP, Pixie, TFTP, they don't want to know about UEFI boot, they want to know about the bugs in UEFI, they don't want to know, it's hard stuff to kind of sort out, right? So there's this gap between the very bottom foundation you start with and what everybody else wants to actually use. And if you look at this stack, we break it down into basically four layers. Provisioning, which is kind of cobbler, DHCP, Pixie, TFTP, we do that stuff. Foreman, uh, Canonical has mass, there's XCAT, there's vendors that have commercial products, there's Rack HD, don't even start me on Rack HD uh, versus Rack N, that's a long story too. There's a whole pile of them. We replace all of those. We call that the provisioning layer and we displace that layer. Uh, if I go the other way, We'll go forwards in time and not backwards. The next layer we talk about is control. Once you've got basic provisioning, you need to control that across a bunch of infrastructure and machines. Just provisioning by itself, not so great. We displace all the control solutions that are out there, and there actually aren't that many. Foreman has a little bit. Uh, Canonical has mass, has some control components. Uh, VMware has a suite of tools that try to do provisioning control. Not so well. Um, Sitting above that, this is where the stuff that people start caring about is. Uh, we have, if you're an operator, you might have orchestration tools. Orchestration tools might be something like Ansible, SaltStack, Chef, uh, Puppet, Juju, Bosch, uh, your homegrown Perl scripts, your homegrown Python. There's all kinds of stuff that's been out there. Terraform is one of the most recent uh, as an orchestration tool that everybody loves. Because it's written by developers for developers. It is not an operations tool, though, however, because they don't really understand how to do orchestration because they're developers. I love Terraform. There's still a huge gap with Terraform. Sitting above that, you have your platform. This is now starting to talk about the cool stuff. Kubernetes, OpenStack, whatever it happens to be. That platform service that actually gives you something useful, something that you consume directly and touch. But if you notice on my slide here, it's kind of a gap, right? So that integration gap that bridges between the provision and the control and the orchestration and the platform side is where we fit in. Digital Rebar was designed from the ground up to bridge that gap and give you, the operator, the infrastructure engineer, the infrastructure architect, whoever you happen to be, the DevOps engineer, SRE, whatever hat you wear, whatever you want to call it, when you deal with this problem, we give you those tools to decide how deep from that control layer or how high up that stack you want to go into the platform. We don't natively do orchestration. We don't natively deploy platforms. But we give you the tools to integrate all the way up that stack and provide that integration and plug in with your physical infrastructure and environment. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Some of the components that we provide, and I'll try and be honest 
when I'm talking about these slides, some of these are rack inside pieces, some of these are digital rebar pieces. So I'll try and call those out for you. But essentially when you start your, your journey on doing something with your infrastructure, you need to do something with an infrastructure management machine of some sort. Your laptop, a jump host, uh, a remote desktop server, a Citrix, whatever it happens to be to get access that you do your administration from. So today we're gonna to pretend like it's our laptop. It doesn't really matter. It's where you might run a browser. And we're referring here to how we integrate a, a SaaS portal with a digital rebar provision, what we call a DRP endpoint. The endpoint is the machine that actually provides the provisioning services. And so technically the way this uh, uh, management of the platform uh, uh, works is we connect to the digital rebar provision endpoint and we control it either through API, CLI, or through the web UX. That DRP endpoint is responsible for doing the provisioning and the workflow activities to get you your stuff, your bits and your bytes on your drives, on your machines, the way you want it. And that can span traditional Linux distributions, Windows, uh, bare metal machines, Packet.net is a bare metal service provider we like very much um, because they give us free credits. <laughs> we spend them a lot in all of our testing. Uh, virtual machines, we don't do a whole lot in virtual machines. We don't do a whole lot with hypervisors. It's not because we can't, it's because that's not our focus. There are a lot of really good tools for managing your hypervisors, your virtualized infrastructure, and your VMs, whatever those are. We are not prescriptive about how you do that. We do just enough in the VM workspace for us to test our product and VMs for the most part, to be honest. So if you are interested in a tool that is this wonderful uh, single pane of glass that does everything, we don't do that. What we can do is integrate very seamlessly with your infrastructure and that single pane of glass uh, tool that you wanna use. So that's sort of a differentiator for us in terms of a lot of people talk about hybrid and they want us to do everything right like, nah, uh, We're not gonna manage your OpenStack virtual machines. We're not gonna manage your Kubernetes containers. We're not gonna manage your uh, KVM based, you know, virtualization platform environment. Not gonna do it. Can they use it as a service provider in Terraform? Yes, we have Terraform uh, provider for digital rebar provision. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, at the end. Um, not a whole lot today because we're just talking about bare, bare provisioning stuff, but it highlights some of the integration and, and plug-in capability that we have with other broad, broader infrastructure, which is one of our primary benefits. Shane, can you, uh, can you share a few examples of um, the other kind of tools which would help you do the provisioning for VMs, et cetera, and uh, which of those have you integrated with? Uh, the, the ones that we've integrated with the most is uh, Terraform. Terraform. Terraform, yeah. So that is the tool that all of our customers want. Nobody wants anything else. Everybody wants Terraform. So we have a Terraform provider uh, that's close to being released through HashiCore's uh, website. It's not yet fully vetted through their process. Their process takes about five or six months to get through and our provider was just written in September, October. So we're getting close to the end of that range. Uh, but we do have a Terraform provider. And that's the solution that works best with us. Doesn't mean we can't work with something else. Um, hopefully, uh, as I talk a little bit more about other stuff as we go down the road, you'll start to see how we can integrate with other things. And our, our base workflow solution allows you really strong ability to integrate with your infrastructure, whatever it is. And because we're 100% API first, you can automate us very easily. We don't feel like we have to be the control solution for your infrastructure. You wanna use something else, use something else. You wanna use OpsRamp, you wanna use Device42, you wanna use NetBox, you wanna use some other asset management or configuration management service, you wanna use Terraform, use it. We are just a tool in your toolbox. We can do all of these things natively ourselves. We can do some asset management stuff, but that's a byproduct of how we uh, manage our infrastructure and our service and how it works. Uh, the rest of this slide sitting on left, 
on your left uh, is the Racken Automation Library, which is a collection of a bunch of different things from community content, Racken provided content, or customer specific content that can be pulled in. We manage this through a firewall that connects through your infrastructure management system, whatever it is, that then connects to your DRP endpoint. This is a very important distinction and under, thing to understand because a lot of people are very security aware when it comes to their management networks and their provisioning environments. They must not have internet access. They must be air gapped. So we facilitate that because most of these networks are not really air gapped because an administrator has a VPN access to these networks of some sort usually or an SSH access through a bastion host of some sort. So how we manage the UX connectivity to the DRP endpoint, UX never talks to the endpoint, endpoint never talks to the DRP. We do a React single page application in a cores model. It's a single page app you download to your browser and run, and it connects to the APIs and the DRP endpoint. So that's how you manage it from the UX. From the CLI or the API, you can completely air gap those. If we take that um, digital rebar provision piece and explode that out a little bit more, uh, I talked already a little bit about the center of that uh, orange box. Uh, community packages are maintained by the community and collectively with Racken. So there's a bunch of free uh, content, we call it, uh, content packs that you can install to get basic provisioning, some of the more popular Linux distros for the most part. Uh, there's a Racken uh, automation packages. Those include things like Windows, ESXi, some of the harder platforms to actually automate within provisioning solutions, um, uh, CoreOS, RancherOS, uh, a number of different solutions in there, as well as a bunch of plugins that allow you to do integrations with other services within an infrastructure environment. Sitting above that, a customer often will create their own content. Content is very easy to create, it's JSON or YAML. You can author something in JSON and YAML, follow the examples we have already in place. It's pretty easy to create customized content for your environment. Uh, digital rebar provision as a product is basically its uh, first release in the wild was September. So it's less than six months old today. And today we now have a fairly thriving uh, meetup, or not meetup, but um, open source community that has started providing content back and they've started to understand how to use and manage that content and provide back patches and pull requests to it to enhance what we released originally from Racken. It's pretty cool to see. Um, what's imp also important on this? Like I said, I can talk for hours. So, um, At the end of the day, though, uh, we do provision. Underneath the hood, you lift the covers up, the dirty bits under all your bed. What you have to do is provision, getting OSs on hardware. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to mm -hmm. and how you configure that OS. The way we do that, that is a, a fair bit different than anyone else, is we provide both uh, pre-provisioning, provisioning, and post-provisioning control. We do that by booting what we call a sledgehammer instance, which is a live boot distro that we live boot in memory on a machine under provisioning. We install an agent. That agent pulls from the DRP endpoint, a list of tasks on a queue, iterates over those tasks to do things. We walk a machine through a, a flow, what we call, very uniquely, workflow, in a series of stages. If you can't catch these terms, there will be on the, this will be on the pop quiz afterwards. So workflow stages, very important to understand because it's the backbone of bridging that integration gap we talked about. Workflow and stages, as implemented through our agents, allow you to control a machine through a series, whatever you want, of stages to do something. That could be as simple as install my OS and walk away, please don't touch it. Install my OS, stick some SSH keys on it so I have to access to it, or stick my Ansible control keys on it or install a salt stack agent because I'm a, a salt stack shop and I want to have my salt stack connected to my salt masters automatically or it might be any number of things all the way up to and including install this application join these clusters bring up my services 
integrate with my infrastructure configuration uh, environment, uh, network, uh, IPAM, IP address management, data center inventory management, asset management, backend databases. Maybe I need to do some reporting and auditing of my provisioning activities, so I need to report back off to my logging systems. All of these things are pieces you can integrate however you choose to do it, however it's right for your environment. One of the things that I found uh, that I have probably not uniquely coined, but is my catchphrase lately, is infrastructure DNA. Everybody's infrastructure DNA is completely unique. Every single customer we walk into has a completely unique set of tools, processes, procedures, and policies that control how they provision, what they provision, and how it should look at the end of the day, and what infrastructure uh, platforms that we have to integrate with. So we've built this platform to be extremely flexible to allow you to pick and choose how you want to integrate with your infrastructure and your infrastructure DNA because it's different for every single customer, radically different. So there are patterns that we see sometimes that are kind of standard things, but the different pieces and parts are unique in every instance. It's important to note that our agent by default is designed to be dissolvable. So it does its provisioning activity, we give it a command and say, we're done with you, it goes away, job done. It's running in memory, it's not installed on disk. However, we have the ability to say, oh, by the way, we want you to be long living. Install yourself in the, the provisioned OS. Turn on your services for your startup boot time services, whatever it happens to be, your init scripts, your system D, or whatever you're uh, using for your control of your services. Windows services, we support those as well. Uh, I'm not a Windows guy, so I don't talk about it much. And then I want to have a long living, lived agent that I can use for life cycle management and provisioning control of my infrastructure fleet forever. You can do that if you want. By default, we dissolve. This is in uh, contrast to how most systems that can implement control to be able to do post provisioning activities, they usually do that through an SSH push, similar to how Ansible does management of infrastructure. You have to install keys from the, your provisioning service. You push to it, do something, get a response back in a push model. Push models don't work. Push models are bad in uh, provisioning. Um, it's important to note uh, in the provisioning stack, um, I'll go through this one real quick. The biggest thing to get from this slide build is we wrote everything in Golang. It's a single Golang binary cross-compiled for a wide range of OSs and architectures. It doesn't necessarily mean because we compiled it for something that it's gonna all work there as we're getting to some of the edge case um, OSs, et cetera, we're finding we need to fix things in the service, but we run across Intel, ARM, Linux, Mac OS X, Windows, all of these different platforms because of, we can cross-compile with Go. It's a single Golang binary, less than 30, megabyte in size. Super lightweight. For what you get, it's a heavy, heavy hitter. Any of you have, are British or know, have British friends? What's, what's a phrase that British always say about punching above your weight class? That's digital rebar provision. It punches above its weight class. So 30 meg is very lightweight. We can embed it in Raspberry Pis. We can embed it in top of rack switches. Cumulus, Arista, whatever. Anything that runs that we can cross compile for we can embed it in, which brings up some really interesting use cases, particularly around edge and internet of things and provisioning control when you have thousands of sites that you need to manage with a few hundred machines in them. Today's data centers or the data centers that were most people are familiar with might be tens of thousands of machines in two or three data centers. Edge shifts that on its head. You might have a thousand data centers with a hundred machines out there, now you have a thousand provisioning endpoints you got to manage. Um, at the end of the day, we do basic TFTP, HTTP for the boot images, um, use DHCP for address management for the initial boot services. We can do static leases as well. We can do dynamic leases and convert those to static leases. We can do dynamic leases, convert those to static leases, and then burn in your own IPAM configuration, uh, address management to your systems. We're flexible in that nature. Uh, and then the API by default listens on 8092. These are all default ports. You can change all of them. 
Most shops you'll never see change 67 and 69 for DHCP and TFTP because that's burned into firmware on most equipment for boot provisioning for iPixie support. Uh, but the HTTP server and the HTTPS API endpoint can be changed. Uh, going back to that management slide, if we focus a little bit more on the UX connection to the uh, uh, management workstation, uh, again, this is where I'm going to try and stay honest. Um, blue is rack end stuff. Green is digital rebar pieces. This isn't quite 100% up to date. There's some more stuff that goes in here. But basically sitting in the core, the nucleus of all of this is an uh, open digital rebar part, the community packages. Uh, there's some community workflow and stages stuff, which is not listed on here. Uh, and then uh, we have from rack end, we have some downstack hardware integration stuff for integrating with Dell or HP or IBM or super micro equipment for Redfish or Rack Atom or ILO or some of the hardware implementations for command and control of your hardware. Uh, we have Upstack platform integrations with things like Terraform. Uh, what else? Some other things. Um, we have the portal. Uh, the portal or the SaaS is managed by Rackin. Um, we do provide free access to it for the anybody running the digital rebar provision uh, open source solution. Um, so we do provide that as a base service. We don't lock the, the portal off from uh, open source implementations, but we do manage and own the, that. We don't release the code for that, for managing and running that. Of course, support and services. And then we have a multi-site synchronizer, which is uh, important if you have multiple data centers or you're running edge infrastructure with thousands of endpoints that you're managing for provisioning activities. Whew. Okay. That's a lot. I talk fast. I, w I walked over a whole lot of stuff. Questions? Comments? This guy's full of BS. You want to hit the door? Pretend like you're making a head, head call? Bathroom break? Sorry, military term. Okay, question. Yes. So the provision cell that we installed is 30 meg. It's open to 30 meg. 30 meg. 30 meg. And if I have multiple edges, I need to install each one of them in each of my edges. Totally depends on your infrastructure architecture. So most infrastructure edge place um, sites uh, often have connectivity issues to their edge. They want to be able to do provisioning and they want to do fast turnover of their edge. One of the things that's changing rapidly in edge is what is edge? I mean, everybody's still trying to define what you do on the edge. And a lot of times that means reprovisioning. And a lot of times people are finding that with edge infrastructure, uh, traditional provisioning models of using something like Kickstart or Precedes or package-based install services, patch and upgrade solutions don't work very well. Your infrastructure gets owned fast. No matter how vigilant you are with security, it gets owned. So most edge providers are moving to what we call immutable infrastructure. Immutable infrastructure means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I'm not gonna go into it a whole lot, because in two weeks, if you come back, we're going to talk about it. I'm going to have Rob Hirschfeld, our CEO, and myself here. We'll be talking about immutable provisioning and immutable infrastructure, as well as Kubernetes immutable clusters that we enable on digital rebar provision. Pretty cool stuff. If you want to talk about immutable, we'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. Edge is very much pushing forward in the realm of immutable provisioning. Uh, just a little helper, spoiler alert, I guess. We define immutable, most people define immutable as the cloud-like pattern of doing destroy, create, destroy, create pattern. And even in those uh, uh, environments, you have some basic initial bootstrap configuration that needs to be done on every VM or container in that pattern. And we enable bare metal infrastructure to behave and be driven like immutable infrastructure of containers and virtualization through deployment of pre-baked images or carefully controlled and curated repos for your traditional package, uh, RPM, DEB, whatever, uh, package, kickstart, pre seed distributions. Automating hardware isn't the problem. I hope, hopefully I've gotten this through to you guys. It's that integration, that gap between provision and control platform and orchestration. This is where we fit in. 
this is what we do that's so very different. Let's talk a little bit about integrated provision. Actually, I just ruined my, this slide, so I'm sorry, everybody. Let's take a five-minute. No, let's not. Okay, so this actually is talking about cloud-like uh, integration using our stages and our workflow, or what we call stage workflow. Uh, Upstack systems, your developer, your cloud operator, your whomever, your DevOps engineer, when you're operating public cloud services or you're operating a containerized environment, you expect to say, give me this VM, instantiate it. Okay, done, great, thank you. That's the pattern most people are, are interested in and familiar with because developers and public cloud is oriented around developers, not around operators. And to do that with bare metal, we have our little black box, which is a piece of hardware. It is our provisioning system. To do that, we have to do a whole bunch of stuff inside that little black box to make it look like an upstack request to create and return state of a successfully provisioned bare metal instance. To do that, you might do things like reset, install, config, test, and join to a cluster. These are example of stages you might go through, or meta stages, really. But you as an operator or a developer or DevOps engineer don't really care. You say, give me a CentOS 7 machine with this workload on it. Tell me when you're done. I don't care what you have to do. I don't care. Just give it to me, okay? That's what we do with workflow and stages. We give you the control to define how to do that stage stuff inside a machine. And if how many of you have actually operated provisioning services and done bare metal provisioning? A handful of you. You know how hard it is when you have more than one computer platform, one SKU configuration. You get three SKU configurations. You're a kernel engineer for Linux, how many hacks do you put in there for a specific piece of hardware and go, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. I can't look at myself in the mirror. The kernel is wrapped around hack after hack after hack because hardware, 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 hardware. What we do is try and abstract that away and give you the controls to build those workflows for your given infrastructure to be able to make it behave like cloud. Some examples of how we do that get a little bit more nitty gritty. If we look at this again, left, left to right on your screen, we start with a new server and we say, give me a new server, I wanna provision it. The next stage is I'm gonna actually RAM boot or live boot this distro. I'm gonna discover what this machine is. What's the CPU, what's the memory, what's the disk? Whatever, what can I know about it? I need to inventory that. I might actually uh, write some of that inventory information back out to an asset management database so I'm operating external infrastructure. Uh, and then I will do any other control tasks or plugins that we need to do at this discover and inventory stage. The next step, we're gonna install the OS. In this example, we have a kickstart template, so, template, so we're doing a Red Hat or CentOS based uh, distro. We wanna install the OS in, image and then we wanna do some provisioning activities. We wanna register the machine. Uh, we might at this point, pass the machine on to the, the actual OS install and the disk boot. Uh, and then we do some final post-production, uh, disk boot, production OS, configuration. And then finally, we're done with the machine, we reboot it, we wanna return it to the pool and recycle and start over in this task. This is what we do very well. If you, if you start to find, you're starting to see a huge, a tectonic shift in infrastructure management from the operators, DevOps, SRE people, are sick and tired of patch, update, patch, update, patch, update. And I'll explain, I have no idea if I'll explain why in this deck. I think that's the other deck. Basically, the problem is you end up with snowflakes. You have an infrastructure, let's just say a thousand machines. You try and patch and update, 10% of them aren't available. You got 100 machines. All right, we're gonna come back in a few hours and try again. We got all but 10% of those. Now I got 10 machines. I couldn't get to them. I can't figure out why. I'm bored and sick and tired, but I'm gonna move on to my next task. A few days later, you've got 10 machines that are different than the rest of your machines. And they're gonna behave differently. In clusters, you start to see emergent patterns that you don't see on individual machines. 
large scale infrastructure, small things make ugly messes. And you get web services that behave differently because they have different sets of libraries. They have an application stack that's slightly different than your, your current production stack. This is real. I'm not making this stuff up. It's what happens in reality. I see some heads nodding out here. So you, I know you've seen it. So a lot of you have seen this. Moving away from that, immutable gives you that ability, or even if you're not doing immutable, tight controls of repeatable, reliable, automatable, reliable deployments makes a world of difference in this. Because I can just tell my deployment machine, keep hammering on all of them till all of the things are done and walk away from it. If we look a little bit, uh, what's the time shot? Because I I'm told you I can talk forever. 740, oh my gosh. All right, we gotta get rocking on this. Um, this does the same thing I was just talking about. However, you might have a mix here of blue and green. So what do we say blue was? Digital rebar open source. Green is uh, rack end components. Uh, gray in this case would be customer. So in this example, we're gonna discover the infrastructure, inventory it. We're gonna do some RAID and bio stuff, which is a rack end piece. And we're going to do uh, things like enforcement of the BIOS configuration, enforcement of the firmware versions that are installed on the hardware platform, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to pass it off. The customer has designed Gesundheit. The customer has designed, uh, decided that they want to do some burn-in. They want to do some CPU memory disk testing. They want to make sure that this thing actually performs roughly around the metrics that it's supposed to be. And then we're going to let it back into our cluster. Um, and then we're going to do the install, and then we're going to do some post-provisioning stuff. We're going to stick some SSH keys on it. We're going to add some packages. I'm going to add my Puppet manifest or my Ansible control or whatever you want to do with it, post-provisioning. Fire away. As far as custody is concerned, uh, you can discover the whole asset, complete estate? Yes, for the most part. Uh, our baked-in open source available uh, inventory discovery solution is called GoHi, which is based on uh, a Ruby OHi project that's been re-implemented in Go, hence our very clever name of GoHi. Uh, GoHi does our, our inventory discovery, and it discovers four or 500 metrics on the machine, mostly pulled through DMI decode and uh, various other uh, elements to give you a huge list of all of the things on a machine that you might care about. The reality is that most people only care about half a dozen to a dozen pieces, so we distill some of that down and make that relatively easy to pull out those basic pieces. We're still working on refining that, what that list is exactly. That's a new issue for next year, so tell us if you say in the previous slide, the green is open source and the blue is open source. Uh, blue is digital rebar open source. Green is racking. In the, in the, in the, in the is it? I'll square that up. That's what happens when we have multiple people authoring slide decks. We agreed on green and blue. <laughs> That's a win. You have no idea how much of a win that is. Yes? How does your binary stand control when it's going through all these different phases? It's magic. It really is. It's magic. It's really cool. We do that through um, a, what we call a runner, and essentially a task queue. So the DRP endpoint itself, and we're getting in the weeds here, so I'm gonna try and keep this short, because I'll talk about this for hours. But essentially the DRP endpoint maintains a, a task list or a work list of things to do for this stage. On the machine being provisioned, we have an agent. Ironically, the agent is just our CLI. DRP CLI in a special mode that talks to the endpoint and says, what's my job list? What do I do? Give me jobs, give me jobs. I'm in stage X, give me jobs. I'm done with them, okay. Then the machine goes, okay, good, you're done. Next stage, here's your task list. That's basically it. With a whole lot of other stuff that wraps around that to make it all work, automated provisioning, locks, mutexes, blah, stuff. So the question about how this is input, the discovery stage, is that Linux processors? As in, so. Are you running a Linux kernel there? Yeah, so the, our boot image sledgehammer is CentOS 7 under the hood. It's highly stripped, ripped, and customized, but essentially it started out life as CentOS 7. 
actually started out its life as CentOS 5, I think. It's been updated. So do you switch kernels as you step through the process? Or do yes, we do, we do have multi-boot boot, uh, stage, next stage, controls. So doing K exec, K exec, K exec, and some stuff through this? Yes, I'm going to say yes because it sounds cool, but to be honest, I'm not 100% certain if we're using K exec specifically. I, I know that we're doing mostly Pixie Boot next, um, uh, next chaining to be able to go from uh, stage one, stage two, et cetera, kernels to hand off. Um, once you do an OS install, then there's a final reboot, which comes out of the sledgehammer image and then boots into the installed OS. From that point, we're not doing the uh, this chaining that you're talking about, a K exec. Um, pardon? Can I provide custom versions of the OS? Absolutely, because otherwise this would suck. Because then you would have our idea what an OS should look like, and that ain't right for your environment. So yes. So generally, the customer only cares about the final green box there, right? They care about the final green box, but a lot of co um, companies have. A lot of things that they have to do for various reasons, procedural controls, compliance requirements, um, they've been burned by this vendor or that vendor, or there's a huge re reason why people have this list that they want to get through before they get to that final bit that everybody else in the company cares about. Everybody else in the company cares about that bit. They just want something to work. But all the stuff to get there is what we're talking about. When you're talking about large estate, um, when I was at Symantec and we were rolling 800 to 1,000 machines a week, we would often see between 10 to 25% problem rate. It wasn't necessarily failure rate, but you know, a, a SATA controller has come unplugged, a memory dim has popped loose, or something has happened and somebody has to go figure out WTF. And that rate is what we're trying to drive down or at least uh, put a magnifying glass on on where things so fail. Observable from not walking into the machine. Exactly. One of our, our core tenants is be really loud and obnoxious and fail fast. Don't keep trying to paper over a problem and continue on. When stuff breaks, stop. Throw some errors, let someone fix it. Because in hardware, you do nobody any good by trying to paper over problems in hardware because it bubbles up the stack. Why do you have four machines that have 32 gig of memory when they're supposed to have 256 gig of memory? And you're scheduling based on, you know, these SKUs or 256 gig memory SKU machines. That's bad. Uh, who cares about that? Um, well, good question. Uh, yes. Yes. Question. Uh, during that boot segment where you're on Sledgehammer, uh, you don't need a logical drive on the system, right? It's just Correct, memory. exactly, 100% so in mount. Can I, let's say I have a, a machine that's unprepared, and can I boot into Sledgehammer, then run Night Array to provision our uh, drive smart. before I start installing? Yes, 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 yes. We do a lot of really cool stuff with that model. Okay. Not just what you're talking about. We can do uh, dynamically scalable, scaling immutable boot Kubernetes clusters without install. As fast as your hardware can boot, we can give you Kubernetes nodes to join your cluster well, with 100% like pure in mem. It's, it's, you said it's CentOS based, so it's friendly with like Dell's uh, firmware updates that aren't so friendly. Yeah, yeah, so we've embedded a whole lot of tools and stuff. Okay. I mean, it's not just CentOS anymore. There's a whole lot of stuff that sits in there. In my case, like I want, I need a Red Hat-ish OS so yep. I can run that update without installing it. Yep. Because I'm going to install like a bunch. Yep. Exactly. But we also support doing other uh, OSs as in mem boot. Um, we don't really do it much ourselves, okay. but we have customers that have taken Ubuntu or other core OS or Rancher OS and do live boot with those and then do tool or Alpine Linux. There's a number, there's a growing a suite of people using Alpine Linux as a Swiss Army knife sort of a distro. Um, so yeah, we do other, we can do live boot of other stuff. If you can pixie boot an OS, we can make it live boot. Then you can install it. Yeah. Our general pattern follows a CentOS based seven thing with this thing we call Sledgehammer with a bunch of tools and do a stock set of things. But if you need to do more, you can do more. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think in the past we have some people have used Mavericks to do Yep. Yeah, there's, there's a million distros out there. Um, 
Terraform. We, we had some questions about Terraform. A lot of people like it. Uh, I hate it, and I love it, and I hate it, and I usually hate it, and I hate it more, and, and then I love it a little bit. What's that? Tomorrow you will know. <laughs> um, Terraform, though, uh, the, it was a generally <coughs> designed to be a public cloud, uh, single DSL, to be able to do control and management of public cloud, private cloud infrastructure with a single DSL. It's a very cool capability. The problem was it was never really designed to do bare metal. So there's a lot of things that are very different with bare metal control from virtual machines uh, and public cloud providers. Um, so we've had to do a lot of work in our Terraform uh, provider DRP uh, plugin to be able to enable it, the DSL to consume us almost as easily as public cloud, but we've done that. And the way that basic pattern works is we run through cycles of getting machines ready to what, um, have any of you heard of the term ready state infrastructure? Uh, ready state infrastructure means uh, get a whole bunch of machines, do some inventory on it, maybe do some burn in, do some asset management of them, and put them in a pool and idle them until I'm ready to use them. And now I'm ready to use them. I want 10 machines of this type. Give me those machines. I'm going to do something with them. When I'm done with them, I return them back to the pool. So we enable ready state infrastructure and we use that very heavily for Terraform. So we get machines to a state we call Terraform ready. We are not exactly marketing geniuses but most of you will understand what it means at least. So Terraform Ready is basically get the machine into Sledgehammer, inventory it, prepare it, put it in a pool with a special flag on it that says you're in Terraform Ready state. Now you as a Terraform consumer, you go and say, give me 10 machines, bare metal of this type. Grab them from the pool, do your stuff with them, return them back to the pool. We put them back in Terraform Ready. That's what we're talking about here, where we have on the left to your right, uh, we discover an inventory, step one, we put it into the server pool, Terraform ready pool. Step three, Terraform create comes along, we create five machines, 10 machines, 100 machines, whatever you ask for. Uh, we return them, we do digital rebar uh, configuration or reconfiguration of the servers, and then we destroy them and return them back into the server pool. So we kind of loop through that cycle. Terraform ready, allocate and use, or create, as Terraform calls it, do stuff to get the machine ready, then return it back to the pool, maybe wipe it, clean it, get it ready again for its next use. Yes, sir? So, I think Terraform, you're taking it from the server part, or you also take on like a VPN? A server is, by definition, in Terraform state, contains IP addresses and some configuration. In this case, we have get, we give you the ability to, so one of the things we haven't talked about very much here is in our workflow and our stages, you can have multiple workflows and stages all at once. And let's make a simple one. Let's get a machine to ready. So discover the machine, put it into a ready state, whatever that state is. Now let's take the machine, and I'm not sure yet, but I have these two workflows. I got CentOS 7 install and Ubuntu 1604 install do some post-provisioning tasks, bind it into a cluster something, Ubuntu to something, CentOS to something. I can have both of these workflows attached to a machine, but then I say, go, CentOS. And then it says, boom, okay, I'm gonna drop into the CentOS workflow and do these things. The next time we come around, somebody else says, go, Ubuntu. Great, I'll drop into Ubuntu, do these things, and give it you this machine based on this configuration. That's a very loose example. It can be hundreds of those. It could be whatever you want. I think my question was like, I want to create, I want to have from that I want five machines in this VPC. Yes. And I want five machines in this VPC. Yes, very much can do that. Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, because you have to write the, the content to be able to emulate what you're referring to as a VPC, which is a cloud provider sort of thing. But yes, you can do that as long as some of your other infrastructure can react to those changes. And what I'm mostly referring to is switches, routers, and IP configuration and networking stuff. Uh, some of that stuff we can do integrations with and you can drive switch configurations and change ports and bonds and all of those things. That's pretty advanced stuff because 
in 99% of the shops that you walk into, you have the network team over here and you have the ops teams over here and the two shall never ever meet. They knock heads and just say, you will not touch my network switches. Damn it. Unfortunately, that's the reality of most production shops. So the integration between network and server side is often a very contentious point. If you happen to be lucky enough to be in an environment where you can drive physical network switch infrastructure, automation, we can drive it for you. And yes, you can do those same exact tenancies where you can do VPC isolation of these machines on the fly. That is a very advanced workflow, primarily because of this head knocking stuff we get. Is, is that done by just one workflow or, or you know? Yes, process? no, it's up to you. you I mean, has anybody uh, plugged it into a CI CD pipeline? Yes, we are designed to be operated and driven from CI CD um, because we're 100% API driven. We're also very easy to do everything from CLI. Uh, you literally drop a binary in place, you can shove some JSON in place, or you can slam it with the IP API, or you can slam it with CLI, or you can sit down and click, 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 click with a UX and make configuration changes. All of those patterns work, uh, but the API CLI configuration. Or, because all of our configuration is stored as JSON, you can take the state of a DRP endpoint, copy the JSON, put it in place in a new one, hydrate it, and it's automatically configured. Which is why Edge, IoT stuff, and multiple endpoint management uh, is a very interesting story for a lot of people. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, that was cool. Uh, some people put the Terraform also on, uh, you know, GitHub. Yeah, a lot of people drive Terraform through other tools because Terraform is not a real orchestration tool. Yeah. Um, every shop I go into, there's a big, huge bash script that sits in front of Terraform to orchestrate Terraform. Absolutely. Yeah, 90% of them are bash. Just saying. It really is. I'm not making that bit up. Uh, if any of you are interested, I'll um, post these slide deck. Uh, we have actually a whole ton of um, YouTube videos with all kinds of different things. This is a really good uh, integration, API integration demo, because a lot of people really like the story around API integration and plugging into other infrastructure. So you'll be able to pick this up uh, from later. Uh, I am not gonna go into the rest of this slide deck because it's immutable and some of the other stuff we're gonna cover in two weeks. Uh, so that's basically the end of that discussion. I can open up for questions or I can give you a brief demo of doing some provisioning activities. Okay, so I hacked this together in about 10 minutes just before I jumped on the motorcycle here. So we're going to see how um, lucky I am with the demo gods. So uh, starting with uh, the UX is, uh, I ended up on... We have a, a bug in the UX with the production release version of the bug and our um, non-release version of our DRP endpoint here, which is why you get that spinning wheel. It is fixed in, in uh, our uh, next release. Uh, but essentially what, what we're referring to here, I'm not gonna go into this a whole lot because there's a, a number of videos that cover all of this coolness. And in fact, I gotta change this because of that bug. And then we get this big red ugly warning. And it may have, it may not like, like me. Okay. I think my Wi Fi dropped out. No, 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 no not Slack. We don't need you. Did it go headless? There we go. Okay. Nine hundred seventy-nine. It's, it's there. You know, 
I've been flirting with the demo gods too much lately. Here we go. Now my Mac is spinning like mad. There we go. Okay, so, uh, all right. Things are just waking up, I guess. Um, do I get workflow today? I get workflow. Okay, so workflow, I'm gonna show you just uh, one simple boot cycle with one simple workflow that has three stages. Uh, this uh, workflow is called Hello San Jose DevOps. This is a Hello World workflow that starts with a discover stage, which will boot into the sledgehammer. Demo God's ruling. Oh. <laughs> I spoke too soon. <laughs> and then it's going to run our Hello San Jose DevOps, and then it's going to complete and just wait and do nothing after that. This is just a very simple example workflow. Um, and if I get my machine here, so my machine is currently running. You'll see on the, the uh, screen here, we have Visual Rebar Sledgehammer and this is the IBJ Sledgehammer. This is running uh, the kernel there, 310. The CentOS people know 310 and wonder why we're still backporting thousands of patches to a kernel that's seven years old. Six years? How, how old is 310? 310 is ancient. All right, so what we're gonna do is go to the bulk actions on this machine. VBox 100 is hopefully my machine. And you see this little key icon here, does that show up for, it's kind of hard to read, but basically it says this profile has been attached, which is Hello San Jose Ops, DevOps. It's currently sitting in a complete and local boot. So next time it boots, it's just gonna boot off its local hard drive. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna change it uh, we're going to leave the profile on there, but we're going to change the stage to discover. And so now the stage has switched to discover. And because I don't have my virtual box plug in, I can't remote control the power on the VM, but I can come over to the VM and reboot it. Now, let's see if the magic works. <laughs> oh, God. God, come on, you can do it. All right, Sledgehammer just booted. Stage uh, zero, stage one, kicking into all this cool kernel stuff. Nobody cares about that. Stage two is going to kick off here in a minute. There goes stage two. Now we're booting CentOS uh, live on the VM. This is very exciting stuff. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Yeah, that's it. All right. So all I did there was simply uh, wrote one stage, Hello San Jose DevOps, that had Hello San Jose DevOps, four tasks in it. Each task referenced a template. The template was essentially a bash script, which just catted to dev TTY1, catted a clear screen sequence, and just output that banner statement. That's it, okay. Nothing very exciting there, except it worked. <laughs> That's very exciting. Uh, and so that just gives you a brief idea of sort of not really a useful stage, but you can do stuff. And so that stuff that you can do uh, in the stage is pretty much anything. Our standard toolbox that we give you is CentOS 7 with a whole bunch of tools on it but you don't have to stick to that toolbox. You can build off of it, you can extend it, you can replace it with whatever you want. You can shove some binaries in there that do something. You have some binaries that do something. It can be Bash, it can be Perl, it can be Python. It can be a Go binary that's compiled. It can be a C program. It can be whatever you can think of. We demo almost everything in Bash because most people understand Bash. Because it's transparent, I can show you the script, what it does. It's really fast for us to make changes to it. So most of everything we show in demo, we're going to do in Bash because it's easy. We like easy, big easy button, easy, easy, easy. We like it. But you can do pretty much whatever you need to or want. And that includes integration or connecting to any of your other infrastructure, controlling any of your other infrastructure, or letting your infrastructure control the RPN part. That's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, if any of you are interested in immutable provisioning, 
Kubernetes immutable infrastructure and, and clusters. We've done some really cool stuff with Kubernetes. It's very, very cool. It's very exciting. We like it. I get very hyper about it. That means Docker also. Just Pardon? That means Docker also containers. Yeah, because we're lazy and Docker is sort of the default. I personally prefer Rocket containers. I think they're highly superior to Docker. I hope some of you people don't work for Docker. So I'm sorry. Question. So the immutable infrastructure you're talking about, that is the Two run, weeks. run Kubernetes, right? No. Immutable provisioning as a general pattern. Okay. Kubernetes is one of our reference workloads. Because it's cool and it's a buzz phrase, everybody likes it, everybody gets excited about it. It's cool. So we've done immutable Kubernetes clusters as a demonstration pattern on immutable infrastructure. And we're lying to you. It's not really a pure immutable infrastructure because we cheat and we use kickstarts and precedes, and that's really not how you should ever do immutable infrastructure. You should have Packer or something else building images and deploying images, not doing uh, seeds and kickstarts and package based deployments because they're evil. You get snowflakes. But I digress. We do image based deployments as well. It's just a lot more work. We're going to get down and dirty in the next session on that. Right. Yes, immutable infrastructure and Kubernetes. And then um, that's two weeks, right, Babesh? 28th of February. 28th of February. And are we right back in here? Yeah. So, right here, two weeks, be here. Well, so before that, we still have another session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That other session is very yeah. important, too. <laughs> so, guys, uh, again, plan on being here. Uh, I will hand it off to Cody, but uh, guys, a round of applause for Cory as well. It is, uh, did, did you, did you want to talk to Corey? Thank you. Um, thank for, you so on behalf much. of Tech Systems and everyone, thank you so much for coming and 